This is Lackland Air Force Base, Texas. It's best known as the Air Force's sole location for enlisted basic military training. The Base Morale, Welfare, and Recreation, or MWR staff, is dedicated to bringing the best in entertainment to military families. And tonight is no different. It's fight night. Boxers from the four services have fought their way to this tournament. They're competing for a gold medal. There's plenty of action ahead in the 2011 Armed Forces Boxing Championship. And welcome to TPC Sports coverage of the 2011 Armed Forces Boxing Championship. And hello again to all those watching on AFN. I'm Van Stokes here with renowned boxing historian Bert Sugar. And Bert, once again, it's great to have you with us for the Armed Forces Boxing Competition. Well, it's nice to join you, Van. I didn't know you'd fallen apart. No, this is fun. And you're watching some of the I think very talented. I don't know how far they go. They're the most talented, talented performers in the ring in amateur boxing as we come up to the 2012 Olympics in London, who conceivably, as several of their predecessors have, Leon Spinks and others, go on to greater glory. But for the moment, it's the glory of each of the services. And that's fun, because you can hear them shouting in the background. Sometimes they make so much noise, it's in the foreground. They're here for the pride of each of the services. The pride and the honor of being an Armed Forces champion. Well, tonight, we'll take you ringside to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio for all the action in the 141 and 154 pound weight classes. Let's get to the bouts. In the gold medal bout in the 141 pound class, the Army's Dustin Lara of Long Beach, California, takes on Marine Jamel Herring of Corum, New York. Specialist Dustin Lara is a combat medic now stationed at Fort Carson, Colorado, as part of the Army's WCAP, the World Class Athlete Program. Lara has been boxing for six years, and he talks about his style and his strategy heading into this bout. I think for myself, I'm just a hardworking guy who likes to be here and likes to exhibit whatever skills I do have. And I'm proud to represent uh, all the rest of my brothers who are also in the military. The All Army Sports Program is great, I think, because it gives a soldiers all around the world a chance to come and exhibit whatever skills they had prior to coming in the military or whatever skills they had or developed while they're in the military in, in whatever sports they have available. And that's a great thing for morale. It's a great thing to keep them motivated and keep them going. And uh, as for the World Class Athlete Program, which I'm a part of, I feel that it's an amazing gift to whoever gets to go. It gives you the opportunity to follow your dream and your Olympic aspirations. Pretty much coming up to this competition, working on how I'm going to beat my opponent, which is uh, Jamel. Duking it out early with Dustin Laura of the Army, wearing the black. I'm a very aggressive fighter, and I still put a lot of punches together, but for a guy fighter like him, I'm going to need to be more precise and a lot smarter, which I know I am, and I've shown before, I just didn't show to him. Dustin Marr right now certainly challenged this land of story flow into the front torso of Jamel Harris. So in this fight, I'm going to change it up this time. I should um, be a little smarter, and I will come out with the win. Laura takes on Marine Corporal Jamel Herring, stationed at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Herring is a basic electrician with 10 years of boxing under his belt. He's the 2010 Armed Forces Boxing Silver Medalist. Here's his plan for winning gold. I, I, I've been to a lot of tournaments. I've been ranked the last two years in the, in the country, which I'm proud of, but uh, basically I'm still not satisfied because last year I got another silver from this previous tournament, which I, I felt that I should have won. 
high score of five to five, we do actually have a winner based on the raw score. And he is your own from the U.S. Navy, Justin Yeah, when they announced it, I basically like wanted to just break down. And then and there, I was very upset because I felt that I basically I hustled and worked hard. And now I, I worked hard to get where I was at, and I just felt that the decision was just totally wrong. But I was hoping for a rematch the following tournament after that. But um, things happened. You know, I didn't get my chance. And obviously this year, he's not here. So I guess until basically I see him in the future, I'm not going to be satisfied until I get my rematch. I know Laura for, for quite a few good amount of years now. As you've seen last year, I fought him also. My style basically is just to keep moving because I believe you can't hit, it's hard to hit a moving target. I'm not, I know he's basically kind of like a brawler, so I'm not, I don't plan on standing in front of him. Just like last year, you've seen, I didn't stand in front of him too much either. I'm just gonna just keep moving, but not as much as last year, you know, try to basically hold my ground. Cause I think that's what basically got me a lot of trouble with Diaz in the finals because I was basically moving too much that the, pun the punches wasn't too much effective because I wasn't that much grounded. So I learned from all those two fights and I'm gonna change it up this year with a whole different strategy. So Bert, these two competitors faced off in the 2010 Armed Forces preliminaries. A year later, they come again, this time for the championship. Does the fact that they faced each other in the past have anything to do with the present? Oh sure, everything is relative. Um except maybe Eve telling Adam about all the men she could have married, but everything is relative. You learn. That's what boxing and life is, but boxing. You learn their styles. And he's correct, Herring's correct. They've both probably gotten better and stronger. So they both know each other. This is not exactly a surprise. Uh, though I do like the fact that Dustin Laura is a combat medic. He can... Uh, if he ever went pro, save a lot of money on being his own cut man. <laughs> he comes into the ring with that. But it, it, this promises to be an, a, a very intriguing fight as to what they learned about that other man and themselves, and themselves. Remember the word experience is really the same word as mistakes. You learn from them. What did they learn? Well, let's hope they've learned from mistakes we're going to see one thing i like about them both bert is they're both hard workers all right soldier dustin laura and marine jamel herring are about to enter the ring let's turn it over to ring announcer castle chalice as this championship bout gets underway ladies and gentlemen please welcome Making his way to the red corner on behalf of the United States Army. Left hander. He is a combat medic from Long Beach, California. Now stationed in Fort Carson, Colorado. He is the three time All Army champion. Let's hear it for Dustin Lara. This is Lara, that doesn't mean Lara, Lara, Lara. Laura, a bit of a crowd favorite, Bert. You hear him as he's announced, and he climbs into the ring, gets that headgear fitted. Three-time Army champion. Let's meet his opponent. Yeah. Yeah. And now making his way out of the tunnel and into the blue corner, representing the United States Marine Corps. He is a field electrician from Corum, New York, now stationed in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. He's the 2010 North Carolina Golden Gloves champion and the 2010 SISM silver medalist. Let's hear it for Jamel Herring. Herring gets that final tap before he enters the ring, and Bertie comes in with almost a bit of a smile. For the bout from Pleasanton, California. Maybe he knows already what what the style is for Lara. Maybe he feels these are my people. I'm going to win for them. In fact, both of them go out with that, not only winning for themselves, but winning for their respective services. But you've got to believe both know the other man, and that's what's going to make this intriguing. Well, let's take a quick look at the rules in amateur boxing. 
These bouts are three rounds of three minutes each with a one minute rest period in between. The judges use a computerized scoring system and blows are scored when the white part of the glove strikes the front portion of the body, the head or the body. Remember, three out of five judges must score a blow in a one-second window, and fouls can result in cautions, warnings, or disqualification. The referee, the third man in the ring, you see there, he can stop that bout at any time for an injury or a dominant lead. Now that we understand the rules, let's bring the boxers out. They tap the gloves, the customary glove tap, back to the corners. This bout is ready to get underway. Arm Force is gold, 141 pounds. There's the bell. Two left-handers. This should be interesting. Which means neither has an advantage over the other. But it might be interesting that they don't, haven't fought that many other left-handers. That could, that could be interesting. And, you know, it's a bit of a difference when a southpaw faces a right-hander. But now, as you just said, Bert, two left-handers facing each other. They don't see that in their opponents that often, do no, they? No, no. This is uh, one of those rarities where you see two lefties. So each boxer coming out very tentative, seemingly. You've got to develop the feel. You've got to develop the respect. But would that be because they'd fought each other? And they know what each other is going to do. Therefore, let me see what he, if he's going to change anything or he's going to continue in the same line as what I saw him the last time. I think as a coach, it's very possible that they each got the coaching guidance to come out of the quarter, be a little bit cautious right up front, and see what he brings you, and then we'll adapt. Again, longer reach belongs to Harry. And that's how he's picked up those first two scoring blows over Lark. He tries to go in down low, but again, that long reach by Jamel Herring. Is keeping him out it on him the off. outside, and Herring's game is on the outside. lara has got to get inside. Shorter reach, has trouble reaching him. Now, possibly, hopefully, we'll have a chance to hear what their coaches have to say in the corners when we get in between rounds. But right now, Bert, I would think that Lara needs to get inside of Herring. Well, right now, he's picking him apart, and Lara hasn't yet. And maybe he didn't in the last fight. Saw, he didn't solve what it is to get inside. Got inside with one punch. It registered for a point. But he needs to do that a lot more. His area, his battlefield is inside. Jamel Herring trying to stick with that jab as a two-point lead. Under one minute here in the first round of this 141-pound gold medal match. And a nice little attack by Herring. That was a nice flurry. I mean, this is what I call an Aretha Franklin bout, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. I see it all in the ring. Uh, she sings it better. Thank you. <laughs> I just heard you. Thank you. Don't, don't, don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> we come down to about the 10 second point here in the first round. And Jamel Herring picks up another point. Well, not only did he pick up another point, he's picking Apart, Laura. That he is as the first round comes to a close. Each boxer returning to his corner and the referee stepping backside into one of the neutral corners. And there you see Bashir Abdullah, the Army coach. Hang on, we ain't going to sit back and let him just give it to him like this. Okay? And they can score everything. Okay, so we 5 0. Let's close the gap in this round. So be a dog, but it, it's got to be, when you go inside, it's got to be a combination. Close the pass combination. Not one at a time. Combination. Okay. Inside. Right, Don't step back. back. Get inside. Deliver the combo. Yeah, but he's also, he said something else that's very important, Ben. He said, not one at a time. Go, go more than that. He's too scared to fight you right now, okay? Let's I don't go, know man. if that's Pick the right. Up. I don't know if that's the right direction. Just... As Jeffrey Ravella, you're talking about him being too scared to, to punch you. He brings nothing. Yeah, well, I heard that. That's always a proper thing to say, but don't say 
you know, he's scared of you, because I don't think that's the case, particularly after fighting him one time before. I agree with you 100%. Lara's not scared of anyone right now. He might be on the backside of the judge's scorecard, but at the same token, he's a gamer. In fact, one of the things I heard Lara say when we got a chance to catch up to him was plain and simply that he's a worker. I like to work hard. It's what I call a lunch pail guy. Bird, he comes to work. And he's trying to get in now. And works hard. I don't know if the pressure will work for him, but he's trying to get in. In other words, I'm not just going to stand here and be the recipient of a job and a job and another job. Let me get inside and take this to him. Well, he said he's usually an aggressive boxer, but he needed to lay back just a little bit and be precise. And he just picked up a point, as he should have. Move inside. That's where he's. That's his area. Tactically, this gives us a good opportunity to look at Olympic-style boxing because we're really talking about tactics at this point, are we not? How to oh, neutralize yes. the guy with the longer reach. And he's stronger inside. You see him push around a little bit. Herring, who is leaning on him, he's going, okay, that's my area. You're in me. Herring throwing a couple of roundhouses, connects on one. We are at the midway point. And Herring has bout. gone back outside again. That's where he's comfortable. Which is a smart move. Not that's only where is he's that comfortable. Where, and that's where he's effective. Yeah. That's his that's his area. That's his battlefield. That's his expertise out there. And again, the boxer that actually accomplishes what he's trying to do, whether it's Lara getting inside or Herring staying outside. That's the one that's going to control this bout. Well, also, winning fights is a function of, of exerting, and ex exerting your will on your opponent. Who imposes their will most on their opponent? That's how you win a fight, period, end of graph. They can go through ring generalship, which I don't think George S. Patton could define. But it's who can really superimpose their will on the other. And that's very succinctly said, Bert Sugar. But that is the manly art of self-defense, the sweet science, pugilism in the squared circle, the squared ring. Under 30 seconds to go here in round two. As the lead mounts right now for Jamel Herring in this 141-pound championship bout. Laura, a bit on the aggressiveness right now. Well, he's a little frustrated, too. That he is. He can't catch up to him. As Herring scores with another body blow. Five seconds remaining in round two. Good round for Herring. Good round for Herring. Very good round for Herring. They come back to the corners, and they'll take this 60 seconds to regroup and get their instructions from their coaches before they head back out for the third. Going back on the run again. He's short, short step. This guy, this guy's got, he got his right hand completely down. You can hit him with straight to that plane right over the top all day long, okay? We can't let him into the fight in the last round. You gotta use the jab, make him commit himself, and then shoot that left hand right over the right hand. Use the jab. Make him work for it. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back for round three of the 141-pound championship bout. Plus, we'll have all the action in the 154-pound weight class coming up later in the show. Welcome back to the 2011 Armed Forces Boxing Championship. We dedicate our coverage to all those watching these fights from downrange. Now, let's get back to the action in the 141-pound bout. In this third and final round, Maureen Jamel Herring has easily led the first two rounds in points. Let's see what he does here in round three. We're underway, and you get the feeling, Bert Sugar, that Jamel Herring is not going to change his tactics. There's no reason to. Thus far, they've served him well. And for Laura, it's do or die in the third round here. Everything's on the table, and you know what? Herring's not going to set the table for him. He's going to keep his own table because it's work. This is 141 pounds, and Laura's going after him right now. He's going to try to catch up as he finds himself deeply on the backside of an 11-2 score at this point. And, you know, this is called the light welterweight category, 141 pounds, formerly a 139 
And you take a look back through history and you see guys like Jerry Page, Ray Leonard, Ray Seals, Olympic champions from this weight class. You just mentioned two fighters who went by the name Sugar. Sugar Ray Leonard and Sugar Ray Seals. Whoops, a little mauling, brawling, and uh, pushing inside there. But the greatest Sugar of them all, perhaps not Burt Sugar, nor Sugar Ray, nor Sugar Ray Seals, but Sugar Ray Robinson. Sugar Ray Robinson was, un he, was he was flawless. Flawless. Look at Herring. He is just picking him apart, picking up points. And, and Laura is frustrated. He can't reach him. He can't get in there. He cannot get in there and neutralize that reach of Jamel Herring. And Herring, who won a silver medal in this competition last year, seems to be smelling gold right now. Oh, he's doing very well. He just picked up another point. When he's not boxing with the Marine Corps, Herring is a basic electrician. Well, he's wired to win in this one. All the circuits are on. My old Kentucky Ohm. That's Cockney. Ohm. All right, Ohm. John. Yeah, okay, fine. I, I forget it. I'm sorry I said it, and so are you. No, I got it. <laughs> All the way. As we come close to one minute remaining in this round, Championship bout, 141 pounds. This is for the gold. Decidedly in the favor right now of Jamel Herring in the blue, representing the United States Marine Corps. I think you can write finish, F-I-N-I-S, to this. Finito, fini, finished, almost, with 34 seconds remaining. But credit Lara, he will not back down despite being on the back side of the judges' scorecard. Well, as you said, it's five judges, three of whom have to hit that little magic button to record a punch within a framework of a second. And as the seconds roll by, 11, 10, 9. It's what you call deciding advantage. Decided advantage for Jamel Herring right now as the final seconds tick away. And this three-rounder for championship gold in the Armed Forces Boxing Championships at 141 pounds comes to a close. Jamel Herring, who was runner-up last year and took home the silver, will now take home the gold medal. It was a one-sided fight from the get-go. But Lara, as we said, continued to come all the way down right to the end. In spite of the fact of being it, on the backside, he continued boxers. to keep up what little he could as an Let's attack. And for his efforts, he got a jab in the puss. As well as another lesson in experience. As both boxers are being dried off and they have their gloves and their headgear removed, they come to the center of the ring. Let's go to Castle for the official call. As we await Laura to come from his corner. Castle, take it away. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a winner. Representing the Marine Corps, Jamil Harry. Jamel Herring gets the gold. After winning the silver last year, he's got to feel good about his accomplishments. Well, Jamel, Let's see what he has to say. There you have it. How you feeling after that great win, Jamel? I feel great. First of all, I want to thank God, and I want to thank my daughter who's above in heaven watching over me and my two kids. Jamel, you were playing the matador in there. He just kept coming forward, and you had to keep him off with that great jab and some good footwork. Did you expect anything worse from that? I expect him to come hard, so I had coach told me to keep moving. Footwork, new speed, just keep it going. Don't stop them because it's going, they're going to try to overpower me. So I just kept moving and moving. And how does it feel to be going to those U.S. Olympic trials to represent your team in 2012 in London? Oh, it's a blessing, but you know, the job's not done. I got plenty more boxing to do, plenty more work. So I'm going to keep it going from here. Well, that's right. You got anything to say to your kids back at home, Jamel and Stefan? I just want to thank everybody from Long Island who supported me and the Kids U program back in Carolina, North Carolina. Thank you all. Representing Strong Island, Mr. Jamel Herring, let's hear it! Thanks, Castle, and there's a good shot at our champion, 
Jamel Herring and Bert he fought a good bout but the thing that impressed me was that he fought a smart bout always and uh, there's an old saying you know feet brought me in let feet bring me out and they did they brought him in and out of the areas where if there was any chance for Lara he could have done damage before you can say the word damage he, he just Jamal could, was gone. He could not get inside of him. He and was that, gone. He was gone, and that became the telltale of this particular championship bout. And he would leave a jab behind as a reminder that he'd been there. Calling card. If it was a calling. You read me. Somebody has to read me. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's more to come. Up next, a closer look at my esteemed colleague's history in covering the sport of boxing. Plus, an airman takes on a civilian in the 154-pound weight category. We'll have all the ringside action straight ahead. Many of our viewers know Burt Sugar from his ringside analysis on HBO and ESPN. He's also written dozens of books on sports history, mostly about boxing. I got a chance to talk to him about his remarkable career. Here's a closer look at the man behind the trademark fedora and cigar. Bert, look back through the 50 years. How would you describe your role in boxing? Well, they sort of put up with me, I guess. But I've written. I've uh, been the editor, publisher of Ring Magazine, Boxing Illustrated, Fight Game, written books. Let me ask you this, Bert. How'd you get your start in broadcasting? And tell us a little bit about some of the movies you've been in. I just, I guess I fell into it. I always wanted to because I love sports. The slashing offense. He cuts Balboa a bit. The happiest thing I am is still in sports. I'm a little kid. This is what sports is. And I fell into announcing because I'd written. And some poor person thought I knew about it. And I became an announcer for ESPN, for HBO, for others. This kid can't fight. You sullied the great name of Bucks. And I've had parts in six or seven movies with Samuel L. Jackson. Bert, the kid's not even 100% Irish. But how many of you? The Great White Hype, not Hope. Uh, with Antonio Banderas and Woody Harrelson in uh, Play It to the Bone. Rocky Balboa. These, these people let me come into their movie. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I figure I'm not acting. I'm just being me. I was going to say the part you played was the part of Bert Sugar. I just walked through and there's an idiot with a hat and a cigar. Certainly, writing is something that you love to do. The hat, the cigar. Why? With different answers, the cigar came because. I just liked cigars. But even more so, this goes all the way back when there were hot type or linotype machines and that was on the floor above the editorial room. The filaments fly off and always seem to come through the floor, drizzling on the head of the writers who wore hats, not to put a press pass in, for protection. They all wore hats. Why not? So I've now gone through to the point where I'm known as the hat. You know what? This is the most fun I've ever had in my life, and it's because of boxing. Up next, we'll have all the action in the 154-pound weight class. Stick around for more Armed Forces Boxing Championship coverage. Welcome back. The next bout has an airman battling a civilian fighter in the 154-pound weight class. The Air Force's Daniel Logan of Java, Virginia, faces off against Benjamin Whitaker of San Antonio, Texas. Senior Airman Daniel Logan is a cyber transport technician out of Tinker Air Force Base, Oklahoma. He's been boxing for a year and a half and talks about what he's learned so far from the sport. I love the spar. I love hitting the bag. I love everything about boxing, the training, the workout, and even the bouts. I love the bouts, too. It instills discipline, because boxing, you need discipline in everything, making weight, um, training, you need discipline. 
and at work, I need discipline at work to um, do what I gotta do and do it well. I wanna be the best boxer I can be. If that leads to being pro, so be it. But right now, I'm just trying to win a um, national title in the next three, four, five years. I'm only 20 right now. I got time to grow and get better. He's only 20, Bert, has a year and a half of boxing behind him, but so does his opponent. But the great thing about Logan is he says he loves the training and the work and loves the sport. So passion means a lot, and you should know. You have to. I've got to tell you, it's a hard, hard day's journey. And you've got to love what you're doing. There's so many boxers I know who somehow didn't have, right here, what Jack Haley was missing in The Wizard of Oz. They needed that determination. He claims he has it. He loves the discipline. And now he has a chance in an exhibition, not only to hone his skills, but to learn about it. This could be a fun match. So Jack Haley got that heart in The Wizard of Oz. We're going to see right now. Oh, you went to the movies, too. They let, they let you out of the house that long? They did, but I had to come right back as soon as the movies were over. <laughs> I see. But we'll see exactly how Logan responds now in this non-championship bout. All right, let's turn it over to Castle for the start of this 154-pound bout. Boxing out of the red corner, representing the United States Air Force. He is a cyber transit technician from Java, Virginia, now stationed at Tinker Air Force Base, Oklahoma. Let's hear it for Daniel the Wolverine Logan. Virginia is a Wolverine. You've got to be from Michigan to be a Wolverine. <laughs> and I'm working, I'm working beside a former Wolverine right here. as he has his headgear fitted for safety purposes. And boxing out of the blue corner, representing South Texas Association Boxing Club. From here in San Antonio, Texas, let's hear it for Benjamin Whitaker. Let's see, Van, if Benjamin Whitaker bears any professional, if you will, kinship to another namesake named Pernell Whitaker. And also, Bert, several years ago, we had a heavyweight champion named Lance Whitaker. Big, tall he Lance Whitaker. champion, but he was a, a good fighter. At the, at the amateur ranks. Well, OK, good. <laughs> As Whitaker slips you would always, in. You'd always try to put that one in on me, wouldn't you? Well, only when I feel the jab every now and then, Bert. <laughs> so Whitaker mounts the apron. He'll get his headgear fit firmly in as our third man in the ring, ringside referee. will check out the judges and make sure that all five judges are placed and ready to go. And, Bert, this is a non-championship bout. Again, an exhibition, if you will, an exhibition, if you will. And it's intended primarily to give not only the fans, but the boxers an opportunity for experience. And you have to understand that Benjamin Whitaker just it wasn't pulled out of the third row. That he, is correct. He is an amateur fighter who is representing a group of boxing clubs. So he has in his own frame of reference a, a big he has experience as well as as an amateur. Now, Bert, let's talk about something. Uh, as we're getting set for the start of this, you've got to begin with a dream, do you not? Whether you're, whether you're a military boxer or not. You do. And confidence. And you build confidence by fighting. So apparently at this point, I have to say Daniel Logan wanted more experience, so he comes in here and volunteers to take on a man who's taller than he is and has maybe as much, if not more, experience. Well, they're both listed as a year and a half experience. And of course, they have a lot of aspirations and are certainly big dreams ahead. But you might say they're at the beginning of that long and winding road, perhaps, towards the top of the mountain. What is that old saying that every step has to start, every, every real march has to start with a step? This is a step. And it might be an important one for both of them. Well, we'll see. Benjamin Whitaker, 26 years of age, as we said, from San Antonio. While 
Daniel Logan, representing the Air Force, is 20 years of age from Java, Virginia. And calls himself, ironically, a wolf, the Wolverine. Yeah, you, you, uh, that, uh, that resonates with you, doesn't it? As a gra Michigan graduate and a Wolverine, how someone from Virginia is a Wolverine is beyond me. <laughs> Unless he has a bad travel agent. Well, let's back up here, Bert Sugar. <laughs> if I recall, you went to the University of Maryland before you became a Wolverine. And one semester before they found out better at Harvard. <laughs> but, you know, both of these... Are you know? First of all, they both look like they're in the learning stage, but they're going to learn something from this fight as to what they have. And I would put to you that perhaps their coaches are as much in that ring as they are. Well, Whitaker takes an early lead here after almost two minutes gone by. What are the telltale signs when you say they're in the early stages? What do you see that tells you that? Well, they're wild in their punches, some of them. They do have good setup skills, but they don't seem to be, you know, really using them. Yes, a jab here, a jab there. But there's no doubling up on the jab. There's a lot of just flailing away. Another telltale sign is they're going to get verbal warnings for infractions or for fouls by the ring official. And it's not going to cost them unless they're warned three times for the same foul. That's what my wife told me. I thought she told you two strikes and you were gone. <laughs> the whole secret of marriage is go deaf. <laughs> oh, you should know. I will say this, Bert Sugar. My congratulations to you for over 50 years of marriage. Last November, 50 years. And I've given her the best 10 minutes of my life. Well, you have my, my best <laughs> wishes my admiration as well. It's all her fault, man. She couldn't find the front door. <laughs> she had, she might have <laughs> let you out. As right now, Whitaker has a five to one lead as we come down to the waning seconds of round one in this non championship exhibition bout between Benjamin Whitaker in the blue and Airman Daniel Logan, senior Airman Daniel Logan of the United States Air Force in the red. So both boxers retire to the corners. I just want to note something. You'll notice that it's a civilian fighting a member of one of the services. The excitement in the audience is not the same as when one, one of the fighters from one service is facing one, another from another service. Then that's up as a traditional rivalry. You know, I talked to Pat Nappy when he came out of the Montreal Olympics, and I said, Pat, how did you win five gold medals? Now, he was the coach of the Olympic team. He said, Bert, because we did everything as a team. We ate as a team. We trained as a team. When one man went to the ring, we all went to the ring. So it's an individual sport, but there's a lot of camaraderie and team building that goes into it. Well, also, they had a fan base. I mean, it was in Montreal, so that, in effect... When he wins five, it, it, it's just right across the border. They're, they're cheering for the U.S. Here, well, it's a serviceman versus a civilian. It's not a serviceman versus a serviceman, that great rivalry. A little bit different. And my point being is that the civilian may not have all that support and that team behind him that perhaps... Good point. ...the service will bring to their, to their man in the ring. Good point. It says here on the script, say that to Van occasionally. <laughs> Good point. In fact, I will tell you what, the, the words I like to hear are, that's exactly right, Ben. <laughs> oh, okay. That's on the next page. I'm just kidding with you, of course. But right now, we've got Whitaker with a 6-1 to one lead over senior airman Daniel Logan. And Whitaker right now seemingly content with where he is in this bout. You don't see him well, he's bigger. He's bigger. He's keeping... Logan on the outside. Logan looks a little lost trying to get inside and leaves himself open. Well, well Logan's making some mistakes right now that you see on young boxers, and that is he's extending, he's leaning in, and when he does, Bert, he sets himself up really for a roundhouse. He also holds his head up high when he comes in, which is not a good formula, because guess what you're doing? You've done everything but draw a target on your chin. That's exactly right, Bert. Well, that's, that's the next page. That's the next page. You got it. Midpoint coming up in this bout. It's a three-rounder. 
it may be non championship in nature but all the Olympic style rules in place as right now you see a little bit of a flurry and Whitaker taking an eight to two lead. You almost get the feeling one could go out for a quick bag of popcorn and then back in. And not miss a lot. What's interesting, too, is that while you have Logan calling himself the Wolverine on the left. Enamored. It, You're enamored by that. I can Benjamin tell. Benjamin Whitaker is wearing the Wolverine type Fab Five trunks. Did you notice that? I, I, I did notice that and the fab five of which you referred to has is always the moniker if you will for that basketball program from the University of Michigan and the, uh, it was a great team 11 to 2 right now Whitaker the strong lead over senior airman Daniel Logan representing the United States Air Force and Logan is having a tough time getting inside that's what it's all about he leaves himself open when he does there is another one. You don't come in with your chin up. And his gloves go down on occasion. But again, I, I want to call these guys yearlings almost. Oh, there's a learning experience going on here. Again, as I define experience, it's the opposite side of the coin from mistakes. And they're learning. Well, both, both boxers return to their corners. During this 60 second break in between the rounds, let's take a listen to what their coaches have to say. I need you to step in with that jab. I need you to step in with the jab. Stop pulling back. Okay? Step in with the jab, let the two go. Okay? I need solid shots right now. Okay? I, need you to, I, I need you to give everything you got right here. That's head coach down Steven down. Franco down, okay? giving his need, guidance. Need solid shots. Hard shots like you're trying to take them out. Okay? Because you're down 10 points. And he says, step inside. Three minutes of work. Go to his body, take him out. You got three minutes to go here. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back for round three of the 154 pound championship bout. Stick around. Round three is about to get underway between Airman Daniel Logan and civilian Benjamin Whitaker. Let's get back to the action. For well, Logan, he's got a tough and hard road to, and almost mountain to climb, doesn't he, Ben? That he does. And, you know, you use the adage about the journey beginning. Someone said that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And, and you've got to give Logan the credit right now for having taken this step. And good judgment often comes from bad judgment. And the best teacher in life, Bert Sugar, and particularly in boxing, is experience. He's getting it. He's also got, he's getting experience of how to get hit. Well, how to take a punch, but he's going to have to learn how to step out of the way of one as well. I will tell you, that is not exactly what you go into boxing for, learning how to take a punch. And the fact that your best punch is a left jaw to the right glove is not, is, is, is not how to win a fight. Left jaw to the right glove, and in order to have that jaw be able to be presented properly, you have to keep the head up. Well, he keeps his head up too high. Whitaker trying to attack down low. Leads by 11 scoring blows at this point in the bout. And, Bert, what do you think about the scoring system that's displayed? Now, we went for years, for, for decades, and nobody ever knew the score of a bout until it was over. Now, today, thanks to the computerized system, the technology we have, score is oftentimes available to the spectator. I'm torn on this, Van, and I'll tell you why. If you have a score up there, and it's as it is now, 14 to 3, and the man who is ahead knows it, and he only knows it between rounds. He's not looking up the corner of his TV set. He's in the ring. There's a tendency for him to slow down, go to a four-corner North Carolina Dean Smith defense, taking the action away from the fans. I'll give you the, the, best, the best example. In pro boxing, there was one fight that had the score announced, and that was Ernie Shavers and... There was one fight in boxing where the score was announced. Ernie Shavers, Muhammad Ali, NBC had it. Not in the arena, but on the TV sets. And Angelo Dundee had a had one of his 
trainers. Oh, oh down what he a goes. nice hand. Down and he it's goes. Over. It's over. It's over. That's it. Over. That is over. it. Over. Over. Forget no four-corner offense right there for Benjamin Whitaker. Bird, he nailed it. Well, not only that, Logan walked right into it. You know, here I am, hit me. Oh, okay. Wow, let's take a look at this again one more time. You see Logan. Oh, and the quick right, and down goes Logan. With his chin exposed. And you talked about it. He led with that right chin, and that time he took one. As you see, Dr. Marilyn Bortano, a ringside physician, and he, she has been for many, many years here at the Armed Forces Boxing Championship. She's very quick to step into the ring. You're going to ask him the next time his trainer says, I got an exhibition for you against a civilian, going to say, why? <laughs> wow. Daniel Logan took a shot, but as he is moving towards sitting up, he looks like he's going to be okay. I did not see that coming, Bert, as we were talking a little bit about. Well, he didn't see it himself. There that you see in boxing, the punches that hurt you most are the ones you don't see coming. The, the ones you can't see. That and is he correct. he turned his head, and the right hand just nailed him. Well, he returns to his corner, and Benjamin Whitaker comes over and pats him on the back and says, good bout. And you talk about a learning experience. Wow. That was, yeah, that was his best. That it was. You get a look right there into the eyes of senior airman Daniel Logan. He looks still pretty solid on his feet as he comes to the center of the ring. Both boxers shake their hands. Let's go to Castle for the official call. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have a winner. In the third round, the referee stopped the contest, and the winner is, out of the blue corner, Benjamin Whitaker. So Whitaker gets the decision on this. We'll get a quick word out of him, see what Castle has for Benjamin so Whitaker. Benjamin, uh, he came in tonight, a tough opponent. It's always tough to come in there and fight against an armed services member what were your thoughts coming into the bout none just relax you know stay focused with what i plan game plan in the gym that's all we got to do your corner throughout the bout seemed to be urging you to move forward move forward with the jab however you seem to be more content to counter punch was that your strategy yeah he made a lot of mistakes so i can counter on him even though he's a short fight i can still counter on him. yeah and did you see any opening in the third round that was different than the first or second that allowed you to finish the fight the way you did yeah yes sir what was that and that right hand, overhand right, straight right. It was open. The overhand right. Well, great job. Thank you, and congratulations. Let's hear it for your winner, Mr. Benjamin Whitaker. Benjamin Whitaker, the winner in this non-championship bout. And, and, Bert, let me make a quick point, and that is you cannot learn to swim simply by reading a book. You have to get in the water. You heard it from Whitaker. He made mistakes. You could see him. He's got a lot of learning, as they say in the South, to do. He's got, and that's the experience he picked up from that fight. But, Bert, do the real champions learn from the mistakes? I mean, they make mistakes, they learn from them, and then they go on and become better because of what they've learned. Oh, yes. I mean, several times. I can give you Joe Lewis after Max Schmeling in 36. He learned to move his left hand up so he wasn't susceptible to right hands. You'd learn. The question is, will this be a learning experience? Ding me once. Shame on you. Sting me twice. Shame on me. Join us next time for more coverage of the 2011 Armed Forces Boxing Championship. I'm Van Stokes, and on behalf of Bert Sugar, thanks for joining us. For all of us here at TPC Sports, we'll see you next time.